Well, good evening. Again, thank you for joining us, uh, Mental Health Awareness. I'm Timothy Wright, along uh, with my uh, cousin, Quintera, and my new found friends again, Michelle and Ebony. Uh, let's start with Ebony first. Hey, yeah, uh, Michelle got some issues right now. Let's start <laughs> with let's start with Ebony. Ebony, what's going on? Hey everybody! I'm glad you guys are back. We've been—I feel like we've been gone for so long. Um, but it's been a week, right? I just feel like it's been a, a while. But I'm glad to be back and glad to have you guys here. And I hope we have a good, good discussion tonight. And if you have any questions, any concerns, just please feel free to email us so we can answer your questions. Hey, thanks again, Ebony, for joining us. All right, uh, come on, Michelle. <laughs> right. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be back. I look forward to um, talking tonight. It's going to be a good one. I think it's going to be very interesting. And I miss y'all. Okay, cool, cool. Come on, my friend, my cousin. Hello. Um, you know, I'm, I'm super excited. I feel like, like Ebony, it seems like forever. Um, but I'm super excited, especially about the topic tonight. I think it's very... Uh, a well-needed conversation. Um, but as always, I hope that this information is helpful to you all. If you all have any questions along the way, please send them to us and we will try to help answer them to the best of our ability. All right. So look, uh, if you are watching on Facebook, like and share. If you are on YouTube, thank you for joining us. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. And you will get the notification when we go live. So, Quintera, um, the last time we came on, uh, a young lady asked a question about some information uh, about the four, uh, four nephews, uh, was a nephew and a niece, something like that. And we wanted to provide that information to her as, uh, as, we, uh, request, as she requested. And we want to fulfill our obligation as we do this show. So give us that quickly. For sure. There are tons of information resources out there available in Mississippi. Um, there are some resources available that are virtually, um, some that you can do in person, but um, with all of these, you have like a consultation where you talk about, you know, the experience of what the children are going through and see how they can best help you. Um, again, you know, that you know, what you guys told us about those four children losing their mother, losing their grandmother, that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, and so there is a program. It's a national program, actually, National Alliance for Grieving Children. And you can find the website at um, childrengrieve.org. And there's information out available um, where you can speak to a live person about, you know, some of the different things that you're going through and see what type of resources that they can provide you. Now, there is another one that is a little bit more local. Um, it is in Jackson, Mississippi. You know, so a lot of people are familiar with Jackson, especially if you're in the Delta area. Um, but there is a more local place where you can go, and it's called the Passionate the past, the compassionate friends, and it's actually a nonprofit organization, and I absolutely love nonprofits. Um, where um, you can get some grief support, um, and then to work with those children individually, along with working with you as the caretaker. Uh, specifically, this or organization came about when it was helping um, parents who was dealing with a grieving child. But um, in this situation, they also work with children who deal with grieving parents. And so um, there are resources out there that are available to you. And with it being a nonprofit, mean that sometimes you can get some things at a discounted price or for free. So I'm always finding stuff for free because, you know, <laughs> I believe in free stuff. So um, take advantage of it. You know, there, there definitely are many opportunities out there, available resources. So hopefully those are beneficial, but if you still need some ongoing help and support, we're here for you. All right. Hey, that was, that was good. That was good. So we're here for you to provide any information we need to provide uh, to you, for you, uh, to help you get through. Uh, so we're here for you. And we, uh, if you need any more information, you need to email, uh, either email one of us uh, on the panel and we can give you um, further instructions of uh, some more uh, information. 
uh, because we definitely uh, want to meet the needs of those children. Uh, so since last time we came on, uh, I had to, uh, I've been in a position that I've celebrated a new year. So I am 51, July the 15th, uh, I turned 51. <laughs> and by the way, I'm still taking gifts. <laughs> right. Okay. Year round. <laughs> right. So, so look, uh, on a serious note though, um, uh, the next day, so uh, my birthday was Friday, and the next day um, they launched a new number for for, uh, for the mental health crisis, and I thought that was cool. So people uh, experiencing a uh, mental health crisis have a new way to reach out for help in the United States, and it started July 16 again. Uh, they can simply call or text the numbers 988, and it's similar to 911, so I thought that was pretty cool. And this is a quick way, uh, uh, and it's memorable. It's a memorable number, and, and it's designed to connect people who are suicidal or any uh, mental health crisis uh, to a trained mental health professional. And I thought, that, I thought that was cool. So you'll get a chance to actually talk to someone uh, while you're going through. So 988 is the number to call or text, and uh, you would get a real live person to help you uh, to get through your crisis. And I think one of the things we mentioned, and, and that's not what we want to talk about, but we are going to talk about it, is the fact that we are actually seeing, uh, uh, and we saw this with, with some of the numbers that I read, uh, that uh, the suicide rate in our Black male has increased. And that's maybe something we need to address. And the question might be, uh, the question might be this, why, why do you think that is so? You want to take it, Ebony? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's, I, I seen it this morning on another post and it was just like, it just really, I don't know, it did something to me, you know, like, because it, it's, because I feel like our Black men go through so much, you know, I mean, men in general go through a lot, right? But being, specific to my brothers my you know what I mean like I feel like they go through so much and is this stigma of black men in our community that you don't need help you just deal with it don't cry you know we tell our boy stop acting like a little girl don't cry you know things like that that we teach them at such a young age so they don't when they get older or even a certain age we don't know how, they don't know how to handle these emotions it's hard for them and then we have those of you know those of them that self-medicate right because they're not speaking to therapists they're speak, you know they're not speaking at all so they figure oh maybe i can smoke weed or i'll do this and you know that's going to make me feel better so i really think a lot of it has to do with the ignorance or the lack of knowledge of mental health checks are okay mental health you know checks should be necessary and it doesn't mean that you're crazy it doesn't mean that you're any less of a man it just means that sometimes you need a little bit of help we all need help in different ways you know and i think that's a lot of the reason why a lot of our black men are committing suicide committing homicide i always said we're on edge they're on edge about everything like the smallest thing like they got to kill the girl over mayonnaise like it was a sandwich you know what i mean and it was another, um, I just saw something yesterday in Texas, a girl was, uh, a guy hit her car by accident or whatever. He gets out the car and beats her up, like beats her up, beats her friend up and then takes off. So now they're looking for him. So, you know, eventually, you know, we don't know how that's going to end, but it's like these people were on edge for so much. And it's like, we have to scale it back, breathe and go back to home base and try to figure this out because I feel like we're just going on a downward spiral. Yeah. You know, that's really interesting, you know, um, because, you know, I love looking at statistics and different things like that. There were over 2 million um, people that were arrested last year um, due to mental health, you know, and um, they said in a quarter of those were um, involved shootings. You know, and like we said before, I think on the last one, we were just like, it just seemed like so many people are on edge. And, you know, like, like we said before, this doesn't happen overnight. 
you know, there's accumulation of different things that happen over a period of time where people are dealing with so many different, whether that's grief, loss of a loved one, whether that's losing their job, you know, some people feel like they absolutely have no one to talk to, even family. Like, you know, and so when you have so many people who are bawling those, masking those feelings, you know, and portraying as if they're okay, it's just, sometimes it just takes like a anything to just pop, you know, or make them explode because they don't know how to effectively communicate their feelings and their thoughts and about how things, how, you know, the life is making them feel. Michelle? I think that some contributing factors, as we were talking about it, as Ebony and Q were talking about it, I think some contributing factors to the, we say sensitivity, is not only COVID, right? Because so many deaths over the past few years, right? With COVID, but definitely money and poverty and inflation. And with Black men and men, period, they are supposed to be what? The head, right? They're supposed to be the head. You're supposed to be able to go to your husband or your or whomever or your man and, and they be able to take care of things. It's hard to take care of things when you bet when you barely make it check to check. So we are just more than sensitive. We're stressed. Not just men, women, we're all just very stressed. And stress will cause the fog and you're not being able to think. Again, it increases depression, increases anxiety. So that those are also contributing factors to the suicide rate and um, um, homicidal rate due to the stress that we're under, feeling the feeling of helplessness, hopelessness. And we've been talking about this since, since we began this live with um with you um Tim just talking about how anxiety and depression depression all these factors contribute to these things so it's nothing no different so I don't I definitely agree with Evan and Q about what's going on with black men. Absolutely. And again that's one of the stigmas that we've uh and I've been taught that way. Hey first of all you are a man you uh, men don't cry. Uh you know we've been taught all that and and we found that that to be a lie and, and it builds up and it builds up uh to something that we will perhaps regret. Uh, so that's something to consider. So, hey, this is what we need to do. Hey, we need to breathe in and release, breathe out, all right? This show is interesting, people, because I thought this was crazy. Uh, and tonight, y'all, we really want to talk about table talk. And I know some of you are saying, hey, that's that's what uh, Jada does. Nah, this table talk is totally different. So again, if you are watching on Facebook, you got to hurry up and share this one. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You will get the notification when we go live. So look, let's talk about table talk. So uh, uh, we're going to start with you, uh, uh, Michelle. Uh, what do you think of when you hear the words table talk? When I think of table talk, every when we when we discuss this topic, right? I went back to when I was a child and remember the good times with my grandmother. How we had our best conversations at the table, right? I have a twin brother, so it's five of us, and we're all at the table. And grandma we got the collard greens, the cornbread, neck bones. Yeah, that's what we had: neck bones, pork. <laughs> we at the table, right? And we just eating, and just it wasn't forced right as you eat it just flows and, in, and we were teenagers even as a young child we had young conversation but as i got older we still had the same conversation you know different of course age appropriate it just it wasn't forced and i enjoyed that time right and i missed that because i don't do it with my family but i missed that and we were able to disclose and get away with some things say some things we probably wouldn't have said on the normal circumstances we got you know got a little um uh, <laughs> we got little freedoms because we we're able to speak our mind right so just enjoy. That's what I think. I would think about table talk. Just coming back, being with being with my family, the good times, and enjoying that. So that's what that's what comes to me. Ebony, what's up? How, how did y'all do that in New York? So it was pretty much the same, right? But when you um when we said we were gonna do table talk, I'm gonna be honest. What triggered me. Um, what made, what I thought about mostly was uh, structure and um, consistency, right? And then it made me think because I don't do that with my kids. My daughter doesn't even know how to set a table. And I was just like, 
Yeah, because we haven't done it. Because I remember when it was time to eat dinner, we had to set the table, you know, everybody comes together at the table. And I'm just sitting here. And I honestly thought about it this morning. Like, my daughter is 16. If I tell her to set a table, she's going to look at me like, what do you mean? You know what I mean? And the fact that we knew that when dinner came, we all ate together. There was no phones at the table. There was no watching TV or eating in your room. So a lot of things like that structure that we had then is what I feel like I'm. we're missing now. I can say in my household because I'm constantly telling my kids, do not eat in the room. I'm constantly finding them sneaking a cup here, a plate there. And I'm like, get it out of here because I'm not housing any other, any other people or animals in this house besides you guys. You cost too much. You know, so when I hear table talk, I think of structure, consistency, and family. Um, and I really think we need to get back to it. And I made a conscious decision that that's what I'm going to start doing. Hey, that's cool. Structure. I like that. And Tara? Um, table talk. Man, you know, when I think about table talk, I think about, like Michelle said, just childhood memories. Um but I think about it as a time to check in, you know, um, when I do think about memories, I have really great memories, you know, I was, everybody know Wilma be right, you know, <laughs> Sundays, we went to our house, we always had a feast, always had great food, family was always around, you know, and so when I think about the table, I think I relate it to food, but when I relate that to food, I think about great times you know, and um, it was an opportunity to check in and say, hey, what's going on? You know, like, how are you really doing? You know, and there was an opportunity where we really knew each other and we were really close and, and, and we grew and we continue to grow, you know, um, but we, we did that with feasting around the table. And um, I've created, you know, not I, my family created really awesome memories from that. And I think a lot of times right now, in comparison to what's going on in the world today, a lot of families don't have that. You know, a lot of families can't even afford to put a meal together when we talk about inflation, you know, <laughs> they don't have that, you know, and when you have people that are so stressed out about, oh, I have to work multiple jobs, the way that the, the government has set things up right now is you have people who were once, you know, working one job and able to see their families in the evening. Now you have people who have to work multiple jobs just to keep the lights on, you know, and not only that is that, you know, mothers are not with their children, children are not around their parents, you know, and so they missed the opportunity to check in. Parents can't say, oh, I know what my child is doing because they're working. They can't say that, you know, and <clears throat> I think it's so important because there's so many different things that are going on in the world, you know, as far as crime, you know, as far as even when it comes to, you know, the LGBT community, you know, there's so many people, people peer pressure being bullied, you know, there's so much happening and people don't have the opportunity to just check in, you know? Mm -hmm. So when I think about table talk, I think about the opportunities where my grandmother pulled up at the school, Carrie Stern, hey, how you doing? We better go make some pinto beans and cornbread, you know? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. You know, it was now, reliable. It was something that I knew that was going to happen every single day or every single week. I knew I was going to have right. the opportunity to be around my family or create those memories to have the opportunity to check in with each other, you know? And the neighbor. Right. Like, and your neighbor. Because it was a community, if, right? <laughs> if, yeah. If Mary, if Mary Ann was at work, you tell you go over there and get Sue. Sue, you ate dinner? Let me get Sue a plate. Or if Mary was sick, grandma send you over there, or mama send you over there, give Mary a plate because she couldn't cook today. So you're going to send her some food next door because she wasn't able to cook and she's a single mom or what have you. So it wasn't a just about your home. It was about the community. We yes. did, when, right. when I grew up, it was the community. It was down the street. Mary's behind the house. I had to walk past the lake and go down there and meet my fr best friend halfway up the street because grandma had to send a plate down there to feed them. And that And all that has to do coming back to the table. It's not just about your family. It's about your community, right? right. Take care of your neighbors. Can you go get some sugar next, though? I'm, I, got, I got the cake mix. 
but I'm missing the sugar. Mary got the sugar. Go over and get the sugar. I'm going to send her a piece of pie or cake when I'm done. It's about feeding your community as well. And have that conversation. Girl, I ain't got no sugar, but this is why. You know what I mean? Or just checking in. You okay? You're not feeling good. You just check in with each other. And you know, Michelle, you're right. Nobody asks the neighbor for a cup of sugar anymore. You know what I mean? Last year, it's so funny. It's not really funny. It's kind of a sad thing. Last year, I came home. You remember, you guys, and my pipe bus in my bathroom. So I remember I came home to a flood in my house. And I didn't know how to turn the water off. And I'm on the phone. And um, my boyfriend is like, go to, get, go to the neighbor. And I'm like, I don't want to knock on their door. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I really second guessed, like, should I knock on somebody's door and ask for help? Whereas before, as a child in my community, it was nothing to, I knew my neighbors, you know, I remember that um, Mr. Jackson, who lived next door to me, his wife died. So he was like an older man that lived there by himself. And I remember me and my friends just going to his house and sitting in the backyard on his bench and listening to him tell us stories and, you know, eating the fruit. Like he had a, um, grapevine in the back and we would just sit there and eat fruit in his backyard and and that and that kept him going for years as I'm thinking about it you know all of the kids like his our houses were so close in New York we didn't live in the country you know so we would just sit in his backyard on his bench you know and like I didn't have a problem going to Miss Jackson or going across the street to Miss Blue or going to you know like we knew all the neighbors but I don't even I can't even tell you my neighbor's name you know that that changed a lot yeah. Uh, so when I uh, when I think of a table talk, uh, there are four words actually comes to my mind. First of all, family. Um, that was so important just to see family sit down at a table to share a, a meal, and then talk about real life stuff. Yes. Uh, the other one was definitely. Uh, you had family, you definitely had food. And uh, Quintero talks about the time that, hey, Sunday after church, we had it going on. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you didn't eat anything during that week, you definitely ate good on Sunday. Uh, and then it was a time of fun. Uh, uh, we sat at the table and, and we cracked jokes and we dealt with real conversation. But then it was also a time of faith. Uh, where we just talk about our faith, how how much we trust the Lord and stuff like that. And 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 this is what we're not seeing now, uh, where it's, it's it might be family, but let's be honest with ourselves. Um, most of the time, and we, when we prepare a meal now in our houses, here's a reality. And I shared this with, 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 with you ladies. Uh, so we are, this where I'm sitting now, this is this is my spot. Nobody sits in this spot, period. I don't care if you are a guest. The children know if they're sitting here and I come in this door, they know to get up. This is my spot. Uh, this is my workstation. This is my eat station. This is my everything station. Uh, but my daughter brought something to our attention one time, and it was uh, uh, during the height of COVID. Uh, she said, look, we don't even sit at the table like we used to because we used to sit at the table when they were little kids. We all sat at the table and we had great conversation. And that's one of the things that was, was missing. My daughter brought that to our attention. And y'all, we sat there uh, probably about a month. And before we know it, I'm back on the love seat. My wife beside me, uh, my daughter, uh, uh, she's at the bar and my son, is at, he's the only one that actually sits at the table and everybody doing their own thing. And, and it reflect back over how it was when we were coming up, we could not eat in our rooms. We could not do stuff like that. All eating. I don't care if it was a cupcake, you was going to eat that cupcake at the table. Everything went back to the table. And I think that's where we need to get back to. We need to get back to the table because great conversation started at the table. And then uh, Quintero said it's so, so good. It was a way of us checking in without knowing that we were checking in. Mm -hmm. And now we really need to check in. So um, when I, when I think of table talk, that's it. Family, fun, food, and faith. That's where, that's where I was at. Yeah. 
So this is a great conversation. It's, it's, it's an intimate conversation. It's a personal, very personal because we can all reflect back over our, our yesteryears and what we were doing and how uh, I, I was reared by my grandparents most of my life. And everything was centered around the table. All right. So, so here's the question, y'all. Uh, uh, since we know what we're talking about, uh, uh, what factor or factors has table talk played in families? I feel um, table talk has played a, a major part in families. Um, and you could tell the difference in people who didn't have that. Um, you know, and so when, you know, everyone growing up, right, small town, everybody's like, everybody know the rights, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, you yeah. know. And Look, Quintera, those rich rights. The, the rich so rights, they, right? So, they <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's so interesting that when people, you know, it's projected outwardly when you have a personal relationship with each other. You know, um, you know about what's going on within your family and you know about how you can help, you know, like, oh, y'all come over to my house tonight or I'll pick your kids up from school on my way, you know, like, on my way to so-and-so, you know, it's, it's an opportunity really, like I said before, to check in and to really figure out what's going on. And the advantages of having table talks are, is you're informed, you know, um, if my mom didn't sit down to have table talk with us to sit down and say, how are you doing? Then, you know, she probably wouldn't been at school checking in saying, oh, you know, uh, my daughter's upset because of blah, blah, blah. This teacher didn't treat her right. Or, you know, advocating on however, any way that she could have, you know what I mean? So p parents who don't have those relationships, I often talk about this girl in Columbus, Georgia. Um, it was several years ago. I was in boohoo tears and she, this girl committed suicide. Um, and she was about 12 years old, you know, and her mom didn't even know she was being bullied at school. Every day she'd go home to her mother and she didn't even know, you know, and to find her daughter who hung herself in the closet, hmm. you know, um, not saying that this would have prevented, you know, having table talks would have prevented, but maybe it could have her sitting down and saying, how are you doing? How are your friends treating? Who, who are your friends? First of all, you know, you got parents right, who don't even right. know who their kids hanging around, you know? <laughs> and so like, who, who are your friends? Like, who are some people you don't like, you know, what's going on in school? How, you know, it's an opportunity to really have a, intimate conversation with the people you love and care about um and and for the people who don't have that you know they always be like oh you know I wish my mom did that for me I wish my father see what I do you know or could see the things that I've done you know so it's it's, it's really interesting when you can compare the relationships of having those intimate conversations versus the families who don't yeah i agree with that and i think um definitely a factor that um table talk has on a family that you know a result of table talk you know you have um it created a sense of morals you know and values because you are you know, with your family, you know, you, you create that you have this sense of, you know, a value, I'm valuable, my family's valuable. So things that you, you know, things that you would normally do outside of your family. And I was like, okay, I have to hone it in because I'm here. And that go, like you said, it goes outwardly. So when I'm home, I know I have to be respectful. So now that I'm in the street, I'm going to have that same respect. You know, I know what's expected of me. So I know what my expectations are in the streets, you know, um, and I, I also feel like, again, like I said, as far as the structure, um, table talk and having dinner and being, you know, consistent also plays a factor in being able to set boundaries. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we have a hard time setting boundaries. But at one point we knew between seven o'clock and eight o'clock, don't call my phone. Uh, don't call the house phone because we're having dinner. 
You can't go outside. I can't do A, B, and C because this is what we're set aside for this time. What we didn't realize is that we were setting boundaries. But now it's like we get away from table talk because it's like, oh, well, I need to do this for you at seven. So, okay, I'll just grab a quick thing to eat and, you know, I'll do it over the phone instead of saying, no, I can't do this between seven and eight. You know what I mean? Um, we did that back then, you know, it was like, we knew when it was dinner time, nobody was on the phone. We wasn't going outside playing and eating. We were at the table having dinner, having our family time, you know, and I felt like we kind of got away from that. I know I did. Um, and like you said, Quintara, hold on, my dog, she wants to make a debut. Charlie, I'm sorry. So um, like you said, too, as far as the little girl, you know, it that kind of touched me because that's a little personal for me. You know, we grew up having family dinners or going to my grandmother's house or even at my mom's house, we're doing dinner and, you know, everyone is together. But I remember when it stopped. I remember when everybody went their separate ways and had their separate lives. And then the little things that we didn't think were so little were so big mattered. And we didn't realize it too until we too found my nephew hanging in the garage. And then it was like, what happened? Why didn't we know? Why, why didn't we see the signs? You know what I mean? So, and just listening to it all over again, is like, I have to get this back. I have to start somewhere, you know, even if it's just with my kid, we, I have to start because even with my five-year-old, he's the only, he eats at the table. He's not allowed to eat anywhere, but at the table. And you know how sad it is sometimes he's sitting at the table by himself because his sister will grab her, her plate, you know, and I'm back and forth and, you know, cleaning that because I'm not sitting down to eat, you know, I'm cooking and now I'm cleaning and I'm doing everything else. He's sitting at the table by himself at five. What is, what is he thinking? You know what I mean? What, what am I teaching him? So I'm I'm so glad we had this topic because I am going to make a difference starting in my own house. We're going to eat at the table. Right. And I think to just be consistent, I mean, if it's just to start off with, I'm going to do it twice a week or three times a week, and then you just grow, you know, you just, it's just going to, it's going to get better. You know what I mean? It's going to get stronger and more consistent with it. But just because I'm going to commit to two days a week, I'm going to eat at the table with my family, just two days a week. Then it's going to go from two and you're going to miss it. And you're like, I want to do three days. I want to do four days. I want to do every day at the table with my family, you know? So it'll grow from there. That's what I'm I'm going to try to commit to. But it is hard because we are busy. Right. We are very busy. But we right. need to take time. And spend time. But, but we have to be intentional and set those you. boundaries. I cannot do this at this time. Right. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's where I was going because we make everything else intentional. So why not make table talk intentional? Right. And that's just something to consider. Um, and, you know, I'm at a point now the children are going to be gone and it might be a little easier because uh, we're still at the same room and my little workstation, uh, the coffee table actually lets up. So it, it turns into a coffee table slash workstation slash table to eat. Uh, so uh, uh, we're going to do some table talk. OK, so so but we have to be honest with ourselves because uh uh, we're seeing a lot of our children get away uh, because of us. And at the same time, we're not here. We're not having conversations uh, with our children and we're seeing the results of it because a lot of times we're not knowing what's going on with our children. So that's one thing that table talk ha reflects that, Hey, at least you know what's going on with your children. Well, uh, uh, some children, and we're honest with ourselves, some children don't, uh, trust parents enough to have a intimate conversation, right. Right. and that's something to think about. Uh, uh, so, so that 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 could simply be a factor. So, we had to get it back to where there can be uh, a, not an abstract conversation, but a whole complete conversation where we're actually talking about real life stuff. And I just remember, and it just done on me that uh, the, the, what started conversation at our house. Uh, when I was living with my grandma, it was simply this. How was your day? And lo and behold, there's a whole conversation because one thing, uh, uh, maybe she didn't know it, but but my but my grandmother was a great mental health uh, advisor uh, with just one simple question. How was your day? And that triggered a lot of things because she found out everything that was going on at school on that one question, how was your day? Mm 
for sure. So you know, go ahead, go ahead, twin. Um, so one of the things I was gonna, you know, also point out is that um and and to not, you know, be surface level with it. Like, you know what I mean? Like just even with, you know, grandma's just saying, like, how was your day? You know, she knew us. You know what I mean? She knew when we was down. She knew when we was happy. She knew when we was sad, you know? And so when you honestly say, oh, I had a good, I, my day was okay. She knew that you were lying or she knew you were telling the truth. Like, you know, <laughs> so being able to even just look, pick up the physical signs, like when you're around people, because even sometimes I do it with Michelle and Ebony. Oh, how you doing? I'm like, I'm okay. No, you're not. What's up? Like, you know, <laughs> you know, um, so even, you know, I just really do truly feel like you said, a lot of children do not feel comfortable or safe enough to talk to their parents or talk to an adult because we are living in a very different time where 21st century is way different, you know, than, you know, it's how our parents was raised or how our grandparents were raised. And so a lot of times children like, or teenagers or young adults be like, oh, they don't, they don't, right. they don't, they don't talk like, that good. like, you know, <laughs> right. it's the microwave generation though. Because that, and and you said something when you was talking about your grandmother knew you, knew y'all. She might have had no matter how many grandchildren, everybody's different, right? And the way she knew you all individually because she was intimate. She spent time with you all uh-huh. over the years. She spent time. It's like the word of God. You have to spend time to be intimate. It has to be intimate. That's how you know if I say you be like Michelle, you looking like what's wrong? What's going on with you? You looking different, right? You can know by a look. You know that because you spent time with me. You know the looks. I don't have to tell you what's wrong. What what Kristen did or what what didn't happen with you. You know what I mean. You know because of the relationship and the time. If you're not spending time, you don't know your children. You not you don't know your your, your friends. You don't know because you haven't spent any time with that person. So yeah, you have to spend you, time. You're absolutely right, Michelle. And 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 it's not to say that um it. I mean, it, it's kind of hard to hear when somebody say you really don't know your children, right? And you don't spend time. And it's not that you don't want to spend time, you know, because let's be clear. A lot of times you have single parents, you know, work two or three jobs. You know, the kids are in school and we're just getting by, right? We're just, you know, we do the check-in how was school, you know, because, we, you know, it's like robotic. You know, we're on autopilot. That's what we do. So, if you know that you're a parent, that you're you're really busy, and I get it, you know, because we've all been there. I'm I'm here, you know what I mean. Maybe let's change up the question. Not how was your day? What happened at school today? You know, be a little bit more specific because it's gonna that how how was school? Oh, it was good. Okay, that's very like you said, surface. Ask questions that's gonna spark more than a good, bad, or a one word answer. What happened at school today? You know, and I, I do try to ask, you know, I remember I would ask Deja and my kids like, well, what did you do today? What, you know what I'm saying? What was different today? What's going to be different tomorrow? You know, because sometimes I did get into that autopilot of how was your day? Oh, okay, it was good. Okay, now I'm back and I got to jump in this meeting or I'm on this call because, you know, in our, our line of work, work doesn't end at five o'clock. You know, it's, it's a matter of fact, work still goes on every day, all day, you know, so be intentional with the questions you ask and how you ask it, you know, because sometimes like when you get back to the table, because I remember one time we sat at the table and my kids were looking at me like, what are we doing? You know what I mean? So I was like trying to spark conversation. So it, it, it's going to take some time but just ask those questions. That's not surface level. You know what I mean? Yeah. But with table talk too, do it, do it always have to be literally at the table? Can it be, I about to say, can it be an intimate, because I have had the best conversations with my teenager, my my 19 year old in the car. In the car. That's what I was going to say. That's what we had. Best conversation. We might stop at Steak and Shake or something, but we eat and we have an the radio off and we just ride, Mm -hmm. especially long, because he's North Carolina A&T, so long distance ride, Mm -hmm. eating, talking, ice cream, whatever. The best karma is just you checking in and tapping in. And it's not, and I agree with Ebony when she said, how you doing? Okay, we good. And we keep moving on. No, we ain't good. What 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 is good? What does good mean to you? I know what it means to me. 
But what is good right. mean to you? Tell me a little bit. Why was it good? What happened today was good. I want to be a part of that. And I started being intentional recently with my oldest son because he's 27. I started being, I go in his bedroom and he wake up, look at me and I'm looking at him. He was like, mom, what's up? I just want to tell you, I love you. What's up? I just want to say, I love you. Mama, what? I love you, boy. You know what I mean? I love you. So what you, what you doing today? Mom, why are you in my room? But the Holy Spirit told me to start telling him that because I have disconnected because he's an older child, right? He's older. So I don't check in with him a lot. I don't, I'm always fussing at him and getting on him, but I don't kind of check in with him because he's grown. He has his own child, but no, he still needs that, right? He still has to know that I'm mom and I still love you. So yeah, he got his own. Hey, Michelle, pause. So, so again, hey, you, you're with us with uh, mental health awareness. I'm Timothy Wright along with uh, our, my cousin Quintera, uh, Ebony, and Froze Michelle. <laughs> and we, we hope she will come back on. Uh, so we've been, we've been dealing with table talk and, and, and just, uh, Michelle, you froze, by the way. Uh, and and uh, we've just been dealing with the fact, and Michelle, you made an interesting point, uh, or a post a great question. Does it just have to be at the table? And uh, sometimes we have to change scenery, mm -hmm. whereas uh, sometimes it, it takes another place, another restaurant. Um, um, my children love to eat at a place in Cleveland, Mississippi called Mosquito Burrito. It's a burrito place like like Chipotle. Um, uh, if I had to compare the two, uh, Mosquito Burrito got it going on. But anyway, that's that's another that's mm -hmm. a way another topic. But I found out that great conversation even happens when you're outside of your environment. And I thought that was, Michelle, when you said that, I thought that was, I thought that was cool because I've actually got more results in talking to my children at the house. Uh, then I can take them somewhere and we just have great conversation. Yeah. So uh, um, I think table talk has to be creative mm -hmm. and it also has to be intentional. And I know, with inflation and all this going on, uh, some things might can't be intentional because of inflation, but as much as possible, it's easy for us to be creative. Um, uh, my, my wife and I, uh, this weekend, uh, um, we went on the levee and walked down the levee and just, it was just intentional. We made it intentional uh, just to just do something different uh, uh, to spark conversation. And I think that's where, that's where we are because we're seeing again, uh, the mental health challenges that we're having, and and we we can say we have a lot of answers, but do we? And sometimes the answer lies in the fact that we have not actually had a conversation with our children. Some parents actually do not know their children until something actually happens. Oh, we see it every day. <laughs> That is so true, you know, and even with, I love that you said that, like being creative, um, being creative around having open conversations and helping make sure your children feel safe having conversations with you. That means you as a parent or whoever is listening have to be the person who is, you know, creating a space where they feel comfortable where they know that, okay, I'm going to tell you something, but I know you're not going to go around telling everybody else. Like, you know, like, <laughs> you know, um, it, it, they have to feel safe knowing that, okay, I'm going to tell you this. And I know that you're going to create maybe a teachable moment for me, you know? Wow. And I feel like life is about, especially when someone gives you their when someone is being vulnerable and they're telling you, you know, about what's going on in their life, we have to be in a space to really hear it and to give a, give feedback, you know? And I think a lot of times children, especially don't like feedback because we've created, not we, but the government has created where you can't spank your children. 
right? It's considered corporal punishment. <laughs> Don't yell at them too loud. You might get a CPS report. Like, you know, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I really feel like you have to really, really, really create a space where children feel comfortable and you can give them feedback, you know? And, you know, when I think about feedback, I think about my family, right? I grew up where in a time where it was okay to give spankings and it was okay to get whoopings and stuff like that because I got a couple, you know, I turned out okay. <laughs> I'm still alive. Right. I made it. I made it. That's barely, but I'm here. <laughs> barely. That's definitely barely. Our, that's definitely our testimony. We right. made it. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, you know. and, I, and I think you can't just because I know when they like, oh God. Oh God, I, it's hard just conversations. Like right, it's having it's a hard just, conversation with children. I feel like right now, like it's so hard to have those conversations because children lack self esteem, right? Because their mothers and their fathers and say, "Oh, you are pretty. You are smart. You are going to be successful," mm-hmm. right? And you know, and you have children who, you know, you can't discipline anymore, right? Because of what the government has put out there saying that what you can and cannot do to your own child, right? So I just feel like it takes a village. It really does take a village of people, not just you talking to your child and the children around you, but it takes your neighbor talking. It takes the teachers. You know, I I grew up where if I got in trouble, you know, my mom said, okay, the teacher can whoop you too. Or, you know, maybe I got home and my grandmother had a conversation. And then my grandma told my auntie and my auntie had a conversation. And then they told my mama and then my mama had a conversation. So (laughs) you (laughs) want to learn one way or another. Yeah. You know, so I just feel like creating an, an environment or a support system where children really feel comfortable, if even if they don't feel comfortable talking to you as your mom or your dad, but they feel comfortable talking to the neighbor mm-hmm. or they feel comfortable coming to, oh, that's, you know, this my favorite aunt. Let me go to my favorite aunt and talk. You that's know, my good. favorite uncle, my favorite cousin. And everybody giving that same message, giving that same feedback of creating teachable moments. Like, you're not going to like what I'm about to say, but listen, but, you and know, <laughs> and that's, trust. And that's, that's a, that's right. a conversation, you know, that I had recently too, with my family. Like, I remember a time, like, even with my kid's dad, right. And this is the thing that I talk to him about a lot, because I feel like it should, the conversation should always be consistent. So if, you know, kids are going to try to play between parents, right? That's just what they do. But it should never be, my mom said, my dad said, you know what I mean? It's supposed to be my parents said, regardless if we agree or not, you know, they're good because they're going to test us. But like you said, if they're going to have this conversation, it's a hard conversation with me. You know, I can, Deja can come and talk to me about something and I'm going to say, you know, whatever A, B, and C. And she might not like it, but she's going to call Auntie Q and Auntie Q going to tell her the same exact thing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that's where it creates that consistency. And it also, it instills that. You know what I mean? Because if you're getting mixed messages from everywhere, then, you know, it's like you're all over the place. Right. So, yeah, I, I agree with you, Q. It's a village, but we all have to be on the same page. Mm-hmm. And or, I, I think. Go ahead. Go ahead, Michelle. I was about to say, or if you don't agree. The child won't know it. Um, right. They uh, conversational between you and Q first, and Q right. could, could Q could say, "Well, let me talk to your mom, right? right? Let me talk to her a little bit, and let me try to better understand why she said what she said, uh-huh. instead of giving right. that advice out, right? Yeah. Um, our children need to trust us, right? Our neighborhood, who whoever we we gotta be, where we gotta control our emotions." Sometimes, mm-hmm. especially women, we can go straightly, strictly off when they say Absolutely. something because of our expectation, right? So our children don't want to, our children or our, our grown children, our young children don't want to tell us nothing because we're going zero to a hundred thousand. Because <laughs> it's just like my son first year of college. Um, mom, I tried marijuana, and he knows how I feel about drugs, right? But he was able. To have that conversation, say, hey, mom, tried it. I didn't like it. And in my mind, I was calling everything but the child of God. I didn't let it come out. And I was like, well, you know what, son? 
Thank you for telling me that. I didn't really feel that way, y'all. I was calling. I didn't really feel. Thank you, son. But I said it. Thank you, son, for telling me. You know, having that conversation with me. I rather. I don't want you smoking because of what it leads to. I had that conversation. He said he drunk some. He told me about the time he drunk alcohol or whatever. Hey, you're not 21. Is that could you don't cause issues? But thank right. you for having that conversation. If you feel like you're getting too drunk, let me know. Call an Uber or what have you. But that was that ain't what I really felt. But that's what came out my mouth, right? Because I wanted him moments. to be able to have a conversation. What'd you say, Q? I said, but those were teachable moments. Right, right. But I learned with the second one. The first one, I, I you know, I just, I'd be all emotional. Ah! <laughs> but, you know, you want them to trust you, right? And, and they're human. We made, we made mistakes. Why we act like, because we parents, we didn't do things. Y'all know we did. Right. But then we want to act like, because we got past it, that it didn't happen. Yeah, it happened. We did things as well. Maybe not that particular thing, but we did things that we know we were not supposed to do. But um, I think if my mom was more, um, if I could trust her more, and if I was able to have conversation, a lot of things I wouldn't have done. But I, my grandmother, my 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 grandma didn't play. Like no, it was you wearing skirts to your knees. I mean to your ankles, socks all the way up. And I mean just. They just, she just didn't play. So I couldn't have a conversation with her about things I was dealing with as a, as a young person. So, so um, one thing, one, one thing we're seeing, and, and I think Ebony made mention of this because when she talked about uh, uh, what, what she thought about, when, when the question was asked, what did you think about when you hear the words table talk? And she said structure. Yeah. All right. And one thing about uh, uh, it developed at the table that also lead into the whole house, how, things was going to be and it's sparred from the table so mm. i thought that was i thought that was interesting hey we need to pause one more time for station identification if you are watching again on facebook uh like and share if you're watching on youtube thank you for joining us on youtube subscribe to our youtube channel and you will get the notification when we go live here is the question where has table talk gone it's gone to social media. Right. It has. Well, here we are. Right. Right. We are on social media right now. It's go it's right. It's gone to social media. Um again, we haven't set those boundaries and we haven't structured, you know, our day in our life to say this is what we're doing. You know what I mean? It, it we're, we're too busy. We're too busy. And it, and it, I feel like it goes back to um, not even just the structure of time, but also the structure of family. But that's a whole nother topic. You know what I mean? Um, because there's too many single moms or single dads and not family working together. So, yeah, it, that's where it's gone. Is it, it can we not get it back? Of course we can. But we yeah. just have to be intentional when we do it. We have to be intentional. Single parent household, that was a good one. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, it is a different time, mm -hmm. you know, where everything does seem more important. Um, and I think we all do it unconsciously, you know, where we could be sitting up watching TV and texting somebody in another room saying, come here, pass me the remote, you know? I do it all the time. <laughs> you, know? you know, so I just think that, like you said, like everything is so fast paced and it does really take a little time. Like you set aside time to be intentional, um, to build relationships. It's about building relationships, even if it's with family. Um, and, and being creative. Like right now, children attention span is like a blink, like, you know, <laughs> so you may have to be super creative and doing something to create a space where you can have quote unquote table talk. Like, you know what I mean? Like their, their card games, like conversation and chill, where it gives you different topics that you could talk about. 
you know, or, you know, they're, they're really, they're, they're really some really cool stuff out here um, that you may have to tweak it to make it age appropriate, especially like if you yeah. have teenagers or, you know, you have young adults, you know, um, it may look different than how you have those interactions with someone who may be a toddler or five or six year old, you know? And if it's a toddler, like you said, age appropriate, you got board games. What's that little board, Mr. Operation thing? We used to play Operation. That's fun. Like, why would you take that out? You know what I mean? Like, that's what the therapists use. They use play therapy when they're doing therapy with kids that age. So that's the same thing, play. You know, that's play with age for younger kids. And then, like you said, with the teenagers, you got a lot of good games out there. I mean, we had the best fights over Monopoly and Uno and, hey, spades all day. Great call yeah, and Scrabble. Right, right. It's the Scrabble, right. So there's some great stuff out there. We go back to board games, y'all. That, yeah. that, that was fun. And just it just having fun. You know, like yeah. I work with families all the time and I'm always like, make a meal together. Yeah. Right? Children have a thing where they don't like to give eye contact. And if they do, then you know they're not telling well, most of the time they're not gonna tell you the truth, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so catch them when they can cut up you know some fruit or you know um stir uh, whatever is in the pot or whatnot you know so just be creative where you know uh, where you're doing something interactive hey let's pick a meal together you know it could be so it could be dessert i love sweets so you know uh, <laughs> rice crispy rice crispy let's, cake. rice crispy treats let's let's make some chocolate covered strawberries you know Come on. And, you know, you just have those conversations about whatever. It could be about dating, you know, because sometimes parents don't even feel comfortable having conversations with their children about just regular, normal things. Dating, having conversations around sex, you know, because at the end of the day, they're going to learn from somebody else. And their friend going to tell them whatever. So you better tell them at home. Like, you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> This, you should be the expert as the parent. You should be the expert with that. Yeah, you know, so um, just having conversations about everything. And you'll be amazed because your child will be like, oh, my mom wants to talk about this. My dad wants to talk, you know. <laughs> and then they'll start talking to you about everything. And then you can probably right. start hearing some stuff you don't want to hear. Like, no, you know, with so. boundaries. <laughs> with boundary parents. Hold on, don't go too far. With boundaries. We got to tell everything with boundaries. We want to tell the kids everything, but yeah, with no, we don't got to tell them everything, but I want them to be able to tell me everything. I do know personally, <laughs> I had a conversation with my daughter about some things she was going through that at first it was real. It was very sticky. Like she didn't want to talk to me. I didn't want to talk to her. It was just like, we just going to pretend it didn't happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? So then it was like, okay, let me be a little bit more intentional. And I start to talk to her and, you know, I, when she realized I was okay with having the conversation, she was okay. And now it was like, she, she's always talking to me. Like she's in school. Te- I'm like, don't you, don't you have friends? <laughs> Why are you texting me? <laughs> Ma, what you doing? <laughs> you know, but you know, I'm, I'm just grateful that I was, we was able to get over that hurdle because it was the teenage things. I've never had a teenage daughter before and nobody told me what to expect with the attitudes and things like that. So, you know, we went from being best friends. to I thought she was my worst enemy. And now we're back friends again. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely, like you said, make it a comfortable place. Because even, because let's be honest, kids have it way harder than we did. Like, as a teenager, I couldn't imagine anything that I did or if I said or how I dressed, if I had a bad day at school, that I can be blasted on social media. Like, everything is so instant. You know what I mean? And they have to live up to the social media standards. and. Uh, this is what looks good. This is what doesn't look good. So you got to try to fit it. They got a lot. They have a lot. And I yeah. couldn't imagine being, I, I couldn't imagine living like that. They, I feel like it's so sad that kids can't be kids. Like and even that's as social media, kids, you know what we I mean? We got like, bullied. We got bullied, but this is a different type of bullying. These it's days. a different kind of bullying going yeah, on. Like I remember when bullying. I was in the second grade, I had a bully. I, I yeah. had a bully in the second grade. She was actually my bully in the second and third grade. <laughs> she she was my she was she was so mean to me. She was so mean. and I was terrified of her. And she was so little. I don't even know. Her. And I remember my cousin came to my in fourth grade, my cousin went to school with me. And she was like, You're gonna fight her. And I'm like, No, I'm not. 
No, I'm not. I was so scared. <laughs> I never told my parents. I never, we never told my mother. She's like, you're going to fight her. And I remember one day we had a substitute teacher. That's what they say. Scared people are the worst people. Because I think I tried to kill that little girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she so bullied weird. me for two years, y'all. For two years. She bullied but think, me. <laughs> but think about now that bullying would have been all on Facebook, Instagram, right. TikTok. Right. Everywhere. And I couldn't imagine that, you know, yeah. that and that, dealing with that. That's a lot. It's yeah. a lot. Yeah. Twitter hands. And once it goes on social media, it's, it's a wrap. It is. It is. <laughs> it's hey, a look, wrap. And, and even if you deleted somebody in a screenshot, it's so. Somebody that's. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> oh, oh, it wants to. That's what we tell the kids. Once it makes the internet, there's no going, there's no going back. Right. Somebody yeah. screen recorded, screenshot it, they download it. Like, mm-mm. Right. if you don't want it out there, don't put it out there. So, so we, we know that um, from actual table talk, whether it's actually at a dinner table or, or in a car or whatever, uh, we need to get that back. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we, we, we need to do this last thing and then we're going to get out of here. Uh, so what, what do you see from the result that table talk does not exist in most homes? What's the result of not having that table talk? Yeah. A distance between you and your, your children and, or your family member. Um, or, or friends is it's a distance there it's a it's a loneliness as well you know um you don't have conversation on communicating anymore um I can I can't imagine not being having table talk with my girlfriends and being able to have somebody to vent you know that I know that I know my anxiety would be off the roof and I'd be so depressed if I didn't have anyone to release to right. not only just not anyone's a safe space. Safe. Yes, yes. I, I hear you. You know what I mean? A safe I space. No judgment. And I have that in my circle. Right. So I know that my children need that as well. I mean, they they older and grown, but they still need that. So they need that as well. You know, I think that that's the that's the lack lack of having it now is the increase in depression, the anxiety. Right. Who right. can I trust? Right. Who can I go to and be vulnerable? Right. You know, so so re- really, what we're leading up to is the fact that we're seeing the mental capacity uh, mm-hmm. from the results of not being at the table, right? And I think so. And and if, if we're honest with ourselves, we can't blame everything on COVID Mm-mm. because some of these things existed before. We got away from the table. It's been you know years. Absolutely. We got away from the. T- it's been years. I want to know. I know it's probably the drug era. You know, the, when crack cocaine hit, um, a lot of uh, that that hurt a lot of families, right. a lot of, especially African Americans. Heroin, war, war, and all that stuff. You know, a lot of things that happened broke the family down. Not just drugs. You know, poverty, um, um, uh, marriages, divorces. You name mm-hmm. it. You it, know, yeah, education. Sure. That was a major one. I think the the breakdown of the family is yeah. what really broke down the the table talk mm-hmm. because where you had mom and dad, you know what I mean. And dad was out working, you know what I mean. Mom was able to be home with the kids and 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 cook and to see that a meal was already made. But then when dad left, mom had to work, so mom doesn't get off of work till five o'clock. She does. She's probably on the bus, not getting home till six o'clock. You know, so by the time she get home and hurry up and cook, she got to make dinner. The kids got to hurry up and eat. She's trying to clean up from, you know what I mean. So it, that's where it broke down at. We, yeah. we needed to, I, I feel like two parent households are a team you know we we bounce right. off each other I, I, yeah. that's my biggest thing I think we need to get back to family right. get back to family and restructure <laughs> pro, the family pro family pro I'm family. pro family pro partnership like because I can't do this by can't myself. do it up. can't I'm do tired. it I'm tired yeah. I'm tired I'm tired tired like, I am I am not that independent right I, I don't want to be that independent woman I'm I that wasn't I didn't I wasn't for the movement I want to stay home. <laughs> I want to work because I want to work, not because I got to pay. Because right. I have to work. Yeah. See, uh, uh-uh. uh. Yeah, we need to go back to that too. We need, we need to go back and explore. You know, because people have this thing like I don't believe in roles. There is a role. We all have a role to play. I don't want to play all roles. I don't. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm Vincent. I know, right? <laughs> look, look, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to pause 
Not for station identification. We got to get <laughs> out of here. Yes. So, Michelle, come up with your final words. <laughs> Let's Look, get, get yourself together table. first. Get yourself right. together. Let's get back to the table. Um, intentional, intentionally, it doesn't have to be a a, a, a real table, you know, at the table. But let's get back to int- intimacy with our family, with our friends. Let's do our check-ins. Let's make it intentional. Um, let's rebuild our families to support and even our community. Let's check in with the neighbor children. Maybe they won't break into your house if you check in and see what's going on with them, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe you give them a hamburger, feed them a little bit, or, or show them some love. They won't try to break in and steal your TV. Let's check in with our community and with our families. Ebony. I agree, but I want to go back to the table. Let's <laughs> let's be intentional. Go back to the table and let's start recreating that structure in our household, you know, and setting those boundaries. Because when you can set boundaries at home, you can set boundaries outside the home. Um, a lot of us have a hard time setting boundaries, telling people no. And once we start getting back to that, we can kind of Make it makes it okay and easy to say, No, I can't do this at this time. Let's be intentional, let's start in the home and let it like how they say, how the Republicans say, the trickle down. Let's let it trickle down. We got to start at the table. Q, you they got me calling you Q. <laughs> um, so you know, I think that it is something well needed, you know, and I truly do believe it does take a village. And creating lifelong memories, teachable moments where people can look back. Oh, I remember, you know, we always got that favorite person, the favorite teacher, the favorite whoever who, who either disciplined them or go, went above and beyond. You know, I think everybody needs someone like that, you know. And so I think that as long as we can create a safe space where people feel comfortable enough talking to us, um, I think that's super important. I have said it before and I'll, I will say it again. I think that, you know, check in because you never know how that one phone call, that text message, whatever could save somebody's life, you know, and just to know that someone cares about you, that they're there for you, that they support you, that they're going to give you constructive feedback whenever needed is important, is valuable. Um, and um, make it happen. You know, it don't take much. Just make it happen. You know, no excuses. I don't, I don't, I don't believe in excuses, you know, so, um, but yeah, so yeah. All right. There you have it. So my final words is this family, food, fun, and faith. Also, don't forget the new mental health crisis number, uh, 988. The line is never busy and you can talk to a real health professional. That sounds like Jesus. He's on the main line. Call him up and tell him what you want. Hey, y'all, until yeah. next time, uh, you are here with Mental Health Awareness. Again, I'm Timothy Wright along with Quintero, Ebony, and Michelle. Rest well. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.